So do DHT derivatives act as anti-oestrogens or not? Pretty much all cell culture garbage. This is the TRT and Hormone Optimization YouTube channel. And if you want to learn all about the science-based information on this topic, consider subscribing, hit that notification bell, and you'll be on your way. Derek from More Place, More Dates made a video on this very topic. And Dr. Jordan Grant wanted to share his quite different take on this matter. So welcome, Jordan. Thank you. Good to be here. Uh, so, Jordan, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> maybe you can explain what it is all about, what Derek concluded, and how you see things differently. Yeah, and it's not necessarily uh, that, and let me just say, I like Derek's channel a lot, actually. I think he tries to cut through a lot of the bro science stuff, um, and he does a good job with that. I think he's talked about benefits of estrogen, probably not as much as we have. Um, in the paper he was referencing, you know, he made a video on how maybe DHT or DHT derivatives work as anti-estrogens. And um, so I just really wanted to add to it. It's not that I necessarily disagree with what he was saying at all. Actually, I read the paper he was referencing. It's, um, it's one of a few that came to similar conclusions. I and mean, basically what the paper said, and you, uh, we'll link all this. I'll make a little, like usual, I'll make a Google Drive file and I'll put that paper in there along with some other ones that we're going to talk about, um, was that basically DHT or DHT derivatives don't necessarily act by binding the estrogen receptor. So they're not like, uh, they don't act like a CIRM, right? Like Nalbex where they block it, but perhaps they reduce uh, RNA activity, uh, messenger RNA or something like that in the cell that would be estrogen, that lead to estrogen, you know, action. Um, the way they did the study was, I mean, it's, it's actually typical of a lot of these, which are unfortunate where um, it's all kind of cell culture crap. And uh, this was an older paper, I think it's from like 1983. So they didn't have as many, you know, fancy techniques as they do now. And so a lot of it's guesswork and um, I, I can't remember the exact specifics, but they were looking at uterine weight in rats and giving them, you know, testosterone or placebo or DHT or DHT and estradiol and uh, just looking at the weight changes and then trying to figure out after the fact what caused what. And I, the problem was they kind of, they took everything out of the rats after they killed them, ground up the tissue, added a bunch of chemicals, and then they started doing their hormone tests as well to see what, what bound. And they were measuring, I think, RNA, different types of RNA polymerase. And so they decided that, yeah, because DHT, we saw no difference in ER receptor uh, number, but the RNA polymerase two, I can't remember which one it was, went down. That meant that the DHT is what did that. And that's a association and not a causation. So that's where you just get into the woods and studies like those. And um, it's all, it's a problem with all these studies, right? Even the ones we're gonna talk about, it's, it's hard for them to figure out causation versus just correlation especially in a cell culture. And this is something that um, we talk about all the time, but it's very important that once you remove these things from the human body or a rat body or whatever, it's not physiologic anymore. You've completely changed thermodynamics. Um, and so it's hard to really extrapolate. You know, all you can say is in a cell culture, this is what this does, but that's pretty much it. And maybe it prompts better questions to then go investigate that in, a, in an actual physiologic, you know, in vivo system. Um, but yeah, the paper he was referencing, there was one more that was referenced in that paper where it was similar, but it was where they'd like induced tumors in a rat and then looked at the same things. And again, that's not normal. Right. Um, but I did, you know, it does go along with some other papers that talk about DHT derivatives don't act by blocking the estrogen receptor. And I think that's, you know, I think that's reasonable. Um, it, it, that, because a lot of guys get this idea in their head that if they take Proviron or Mastron or a DHT derivative in general, that they're going to be blocking the estrogen receptor, just like if they were taking Nalbidex um, or Clomid or Riloxifene or any of those CIRMs. Um, and I don't think that's what's happening. But I did find, and I'll link all these, I did find a lot of papers. Unfortunately, most of them are also cell culture studies. Um, and I, just because that's easy, right? It's easier for them to do that than to try to really figure out what's going on in the body when you do something. The ones where they do look at in vivo, they usually castrate the animals or they give them something else. So they're not looking at a DHT derivative in addition to testosterone, which is what we want to know. Like, cause you, you still have your normal testosterone aromatization going on. What happens when you throw a DHT derivative at that? Does that lower estradiol? They don't look at that. So 
from what I've seen anecdotally, and we've got guys on the forum that have posted about this. And again, I think anecdote actually counts for a lot because you're dealing with humans taking something, variables that just one variable changes, what happens, right? Like, so that's, that's not um, without use, you know, compared to a cell culture study, which may be meaningless. And a lot of guys have, have posted their blood work where all they did was add, you know, Mastron or Primabolin or something, they're taking a steroid cycle, whatever, and they lost their sex drive and all that, and they checked their E2 and it was crashed. Um, and so that, you know, something changed, right? And I've seen that enough, and it's not just with DHT derivatives. I've seen reports of that with boldenone, and I've talked about that before on here, that it, that, and the reason is it's, these things bind aromatase, right? They're close enough in structure to testosterone that they're still latching onto that aromatase enzyme, but they're not themselves being aromatized much, if at all. Um, we talked about this with Nandrolone. We, we talked about it a lot in the forum. I don't know, close to a year ago. I don't even know when that was now. Uh, it was a long time ago, six months, eight months. And uh, lots of studies on that showing that even Nandrolone binds aromatase, but itself is minimally aromatized at all. And um, you can see that in guys that are on higher doses of like DECA or something, but not a lot of testosterone. Their estradiol will be very low. Um, so I just think the bigger picture is, guys... <laughs> Stop worrying about your estrogen, obviously, like we always talk about. Um, if you're, if you're going to take these things, you have to realize that they can affect aromatization. Um, and they can cause decreased libido, sex drive, you know, sex drive issues, ED, um, possibly vascular insults if you dropped it low enough. I mean, if you're taking enough testosterone to offset it, it's probably not a big deal. Because I don't think these things act just like a steroidal aromatase inhibitor. Although... I'll find it. There was one study. I can't remember if it was in vitro or not. It was looking at like granulosa cells, but they are actually using many different things to see what it effect on aromatase. And um, the DHT was actually more potent than one of than like formistane, I think, which was an old school aromatase inhibitor, which is like a mild steroid. I mean, it's the same principle, right? It's structure. It's basically a steroidal aromatase inhibitor. Um, nowadays, they just have them that are like eczemastane, you know, aromasin. They're just much more potent. Um, whereas like, you know, Arimidex is not a steroidal aromatase inhibitor. It does something different. But, um, anyway, the principle is that any of these things can likely, and it may, it may be person dependent. I don't know. Um, but based on blood work and based on what I see in the studies here, these DHT derivatives or DHT itself strongly can bind aromatase. Um, it's actually the, the one I found here that uh, was the most interesting to me was from 2012. So that's about the most recent I could find. And again, it's in vitro. They, they basically used recombinant technology plasmids to kind of induce human aromatase in E. coli bacteria and then see what happened when they added different androgens. Um, and it was pretty fascinating. And again, may have no relevance at all to hum human physiology, but that DHT was actually metabolized by aromatase, but it wasn't into estrogen, obviously. It was into a couple different oxidized metabolites. So what are those doing downstream, right? If that's happening in us, um, and they can detect these metabolites, you know, in urine, that's how they detect drug use in a lot of steroid users. Um, are those metabolites also affecting aromatase or are they affecting estrogen RNA synthesis? Like we found in that other paper, maybe it's the metabolite that's doing it. I don't know. But I think the big picture is that you just got to be careful. Like I had seen a guy on the forum post that he got all the side effects from low E when he was taking his TRT was interestingly enough, 200 milligrams of deco a week and only 50 milligrams of testosterone. And then he added in Anavar and he started getting low E effects. And he said his blood work didn't change. His E2 was still listed at 40, but here's the deal. And this is what we've talked about a million times. And that's something that I think Derek still hasn't hit on. And a lot of places haven't is that that serum level is not telling you what's going on at a tissue level, right? That serum level, and, and Danny gave the swimming pool analogy in this one video, right? And I was I actually should probably make a little better analogy right now because I think it'll help people understand. So looking at a blood level of E2 would be like if you had 20 swimming pools, all, all connected a little bit by pipe, and you had one place from one pool that was leaking water, and you measured the water and then you decided that based on that, you could figure out the level of water in every single swimming pool. You can't do that. It's impossible. 
you don't know if the, you know what I mean? It's just, everything's connecting and then leaking from one point. And, and there's, it's not exactly the way it works in the body, but so kind of like I explained to this guy, your serum level, maybe it was 40, but you don't know what your aromatase level in the brain was. You could, it could have already been low because you're only on 50 milligrams of testosterone a week. So it's probably really low. And then you throw in that DHT derivative and you may crash that to zero. And that's why you get those symptoms. You may still have a normal level in the blood, maybe coming from adipocytes or somewhere else, but that doesn't tell you what every compartment is doing. And so we've got to get away from this idea that measuring that serum level is telling you exactly what's going on. And, uh, and, and Derek mentioned that in his video about, you know, uh, free T or, or T to E ratios. And I think he talked about things in the, happening in the breast and, Again, yes, there's a ratio issue, but you can't measure that by a serum blood test for E2. You would have to actually figure out those, like if it was, let's say it was you're prone to gyno, maybe it's because the ratio in the breast tissue is off, but that doesn't mean it's off everywhere else. You'd have to figure that out by finding that ratio in the breast tissue, right? And um, so it's, it's, it's little things like that that I think people just need to keep in mind that it's, it's not this easy yeah, I know if I get my ratio on the blood test this way, I'll be fine. It's not at all. I mean, we got guys all over the map with the same blood levels that have different symptoms and all that stuff. So, um, but yeah, that's the main thing. Um, I try to point out to guys that any of these androgens that are related to testosterone can bind the aromatase enzyme. And it makes sense if you just think about it from a structural standpoint, but they themselves will not be really aromatized. And so that can start causing issues with your ratios, basically. Um, and a lot of guys, you know, may have to actually bump up their, if they're gonna do that, they might have to increase their testosterone doses. A lot of guys think they can decrease it. Like, oh yeah, I'll just take 100 milligrams of test and then 100 of Mastron. You're lower in your E2 more than you would if you were just taking 100 milligrams of test alone, right? So that can actually lead to more harm than good. And physiologically or, or from a health standpoint, that could be a big deal. You may feel fine on it. Uh, from what I've seen, a lot of guys, when they add in a DHT derivative, they'll feel good for a few weeks. I guess because they get that bump, you know, central nervous activation from DHT, but then they'll start feeling worse. You know, they, they actually lose libido and all that stuff. And I've seen that a lot in guys, not everyone. Some guys love proviron. They'll take it forever and they have no problems. So proviron is probably a lot weaker as well on the aromatase issue and all that. I think it's fairly weak compared to something like Masteron. What I've seen from guys on the forums that have, have taken cycles is Primo. Primo seems to really knock down E2 quite a bit. They're actual levels, which tells me it's interfering with aromatase. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's kind of my spiel. It wasn't that Derek was wrong by any means. I think the study was actually pretty interesting. It's, you know, it's kind of funky the way they did it just, but that's how a lot of these older studies are. And they think that they can just grind up this tissue and homogenize it and then start playing with it in a dish and see what happens and extrapolate something from that. And even in the paper, when you read it, you can see the way they say things is like, well, this may be because of this, and this might be that it's all these, maybe we don't know, but then if it gets referenced in another paper down the road, it's like it was a fact. And that's what you see in all these papers, right? It's not just with this. It's, if something was never actually shown to be true, but somebody just said it was, and then they'll reference that in their own paper. And then you just have years of layers of crap that you don't know what's what. And that's what I found with a lot of the E2 estradiol stuff too. And, and it's the same with, like we talked about with prostate cancer and testosterone, right? You had just years of a faulty paradigm and they had built on that. And uh, it's just stuff like that. Well, you really got to get down to the bottom of it. <laughs> Funny enough, this has nothing to do with E2. I had a rep come to the office recently for, a, I think it was for Zytiga. It was one of the anti-prostate anti cancer drugs that once you're metastatic and she started talking to me and I was like, you know that uh, androgens actually don't cause prostate cancer and all this stuff is really kind of BS. And I was like, I really wish they'd just get away from this whole paradigm. I said, but the funny enough is that would hurt your business. And one, and she got it, right? She's like, oh yeah, that would be terrible. And I said, but that's the problem because once people are invested enough, and they put billions into these drugs, it's going to be hard to go in and say, you know, you guys are actually not focusing on the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're hurting men by doing this. You're blocking every channel of androgen action and synthesis that you can when there's likely something else going on. Like you're just putting tiny band-aids on something that doesn't, it actually ends up making it worse. And, uh, but that's going to be a hard thing to change until you change the mindset. So anyway, that was just a little aside. So. Well, great, uh, Jordan. Thank you for clarifying this. Thanks. Yeah, and I'll, uh, I'll, like I said, I'll put together a little 
drive file. People read it for yourself, see what you think. Like I said, none of this stuff is set in stone. These studies are pretty much all cell culture garbage. And so um, it was funny enough because I tried to find a lot of the good studies on Masteron when they use it in breast cancer patients and um, I couldn't get full access. They were in this from the seventies. Um, and, but the ones I could get full access to, they still never even mentioned how they thought it was working. I mean, it was mainly they were trying to figure out, they thought it was blocking estrogen at the receptor, and then they'd find out that it really wasn't. But they never even mentioned aromatase activity, which I thought was really interesting in that. But um, yeah, I'll link them. You guys read them. Like I said, this was, this was not a refutation of Derek, uh, his video at all, because like I said, I think there's probably something to that, that. And it makes sense, right? If you're throwing in an androgen, it's going to change the way things are signaled in the cell just because that's what you're doing. And especially something like DHT, where you were really not supposed to have that much DHT. And then you throw that in. It's a very potent androgen. It binds strongly to the AR and it can definitely cause these other issues. But whether it's from decreased, you know, mRNA from an E2 issue or is it, is it the opposite effect, you know, cause and effect, it's hard to know. Uh, and that's where I think the anecdotal part actually comes in handier in humans. You can just, you know, guys can just tell, you know, hey, if I throw this in, check my E2 before and check it after, and you'll probably see a decrease. It's not anywhere near as strong as an aromatase inhibitor. So guys probably don't have to worry, but I have seen some guys where it is. They're sensitive mm -hmm. to it for whatever reason. So just be careful. That's the, that's the uh, gist of today's video is just be careful when you're doing this stuff. I really still think you can be optimized on testosterone alone. Um, if guys want to throw in nandrolone for joint pain, do it at low doses. Don't do 200 milligrams a week because you may start running into issues. Um, you can do what you want, but you know, for my patients, I mean, my guys are, they're optimized on T alone. And the other thing is stop worrying about estrogen. Stop worrying about side effects. If you go into TRT and we see this all the time on the forum, I talked to a guy today. I was like, he's like, what can I expect to in a bad way? Like, what can I expect when I start? Am I going to have lower uh, ejaculation loads and all this? It's like, stop, don't go into this with a bad attitude. Don't think that you're going to have bad side effects because you'll never be happy. And it's the same thing when we talk guys out of getting off their aromatase inhibitors, you've got to get out of the mindset that E2 is the devil. And once you do, once you literally just flip that switch, it's amazing how guys all of a sudden go, I feel better than I've ever felt because the mind is the most powerful part of all this. Mm -hmm. So try to have good expectations when you get on TRT realize you're doing something that's good for your health and it should make you motivated to eat better, work out. I mean, it's a lifestyle thing, right? Like positive, be positive about it. Don't worry about every little thing you do. Like if I'm, if I miss an injection tonight and I do it tomorrow, am I going to feel bad? Don't, no, no, just, just calm down. Like it's all good. It just enjoy the ride, right? You're doing something good. And uh, if you expect good things to happen in most cases, they will. So unless you're on a crappy protocol, but we can help you with that. So, Thanks so much, Jordan. Thanks. All right. Y'all have a good one. And now, do this next. Click on one of these thumbnails to learn a ton more about TRT and hormone optimization.